basics, welcome to uh, Wednesday's story time, and today we're on chapter 17. Um, so, the other hybrids found out uh, that Lily's mum knew Dr. Dross, and they weren't very impressed, and they weren't impressed that Lily had lied to them. So, let's see, because she needs their help, doesn't she, in order to make sure she can escape. Let's see what happens today. The rest of the morning passed with the hybrids stewing in silent time. Lily had wound Malkin and explained to him quietly what was going on, but he'd said a little. He was tired from his previous night's excursion, and anyway, he counselled Lily. It was best to give the other children time and space to calm down. The fox had wanted to go out again and rec uh, reconnaissance, but the hybrids had angrily insisted it was too dangerous. The lunk was coming to fetch them for rehearsals later, and if he found Malkin missing, or if there was another snap inspection and the fox wasn't there, then there would be hell to pay. The lunk did indeed arrive that afternoon to fetch Lily and the others from the south. Malcolm tried to go with them, but the mechanical man shoved him back violently and slammed the door on his screeching, uh, screeching claws. And so Lily found herself alone in the company of three people who were not talking to her as the lunk unlocked the gate outside room 13 and escorted them along the labyrinthine passageways of the gondola. When they descended the stairs and stepped through the exit hatch, Lily made sure to note what type of lock it was, knowing she would probably need to pick it later. She hoped Robert had managed to find her the, the lock picks. It was cold outside in the field. Lily wound her scarf tightly around her. The other hybrids had changed from their grey prison clothes into show outfits from their trunk in the corner of the room, but she was still wearing her ragged and rumpled red dress. As the lump led them towards the big top, Lily tried to join Angelique at the back of the line. But the winged girl turned away and put her stick between them so that Lily could come no closer. The only time she smiled was at a flock of sparrows twittering around a puddle. Angelique pulled handfuls of breadcrumbs from her pockets and held them out to the birds, whistling softly to imitate their calls. Some of the sparrows flitted over to her and sat in her palm, pecking at the stale bread that Lily realised she must have saved from the breakfast tray. They skirted round the edge of the big top, passing a stitched scarf. It was the hole Robert had cut in the tent the other evening, already sewn up. The lump peeled back the flap of the artist's entrance and ushered everyone through. Inside the tent, sunlight filtered through the striped canvas, throwing blocks of red and white across two makeup tables, a rail of costumes, stacks of props, and the big red curtains that separated backstage from the performance area out front. Lily followed the hybrids as they crossed the cluttered area and pushed aside the velvet curtains. The seats were already set up around the ring, and as she glimpsed the VIP area in the centre in the centre of the front row, a horrible feeling came over Lily. Little more than a day ago, she'd sat there watching the show with Robert, Tolly, and Malkin, and tomorrow night she was destined to be part of it, to be put in some terrible machine of Madame Androsi's devising. Unless she could escape. And she would need not only Robert's help for that, who she still hadn't seen today, but also the hybrids, and they weren't speaking to her. She felt sick. How could this be happening? And she missed the part. Why had they not come to rescue her? She wished she'd listened to Mrs. Rust and never left the house. You're all here. Good. Someone stepped from behind one of the stands, out into the centre of the arena. We'll start with five minutes warm-up, he said to the hybrids. Then you practice your routines. I want to see perfection today. Tomorrow's show is Lily's debut. He gave her a gold toothed leer. And I want the rest of you to be at your very best to help make this new extravaganza our crowning glory. The hybrids spread out around the sawdust ring and began their warm up exercises. Angelique opening out her wings and checking each feather. Dee Dee stretching her legs until the wires in them whirred, and Luca clapping his claws and shrugging his shoulders to try and ease his arms into movement. The lunk stomped squeakily around the ring, observing them. Lily didn't know what she ought to do, so she stood and watched the others, while also keeping her eye out for Robert in case he was nearby. A handful of roustabouts were wandering around the tent, and Lily looked for him amongst them, but he wasn't there. Staring at the empty stands, she suddenly imagined what it might be like when they were full and all eyes were on her. She wondered what Slimwood and Madame had planned with their machine. What, their, well, what were they going to make her do? 
And how could she avoid it and get out of here now Angelique, Dee Dee and Luca were no longer on her side? Eventually, she looked up to see Madame had arrived. She and Slimwood were huddled in the middle of the ring, whispering to each other and throwing occasional glances her way. Lily shuffled closer to them to try and hear what they were saying. Zut alors, Madame muttered angrily. Those clowns are so late with my machine. I wanted to try it out this morning. Slimwood stroked her arm. You just have to leave it for now, my dear. Never mind, Madame sighed and pushed his hand away. She strode over to Lily and grabbed her by the arm. Enough of your eavesdropping, she said. It's time we practice your courtesy and found something for you to wear for your routine tomorrow night. Madame dragged Lily across the ring. Lily's palms itched and her stomach flipped while she wondered what horrors they had in store for her. Time was running out and Robert still hadn't arrived with her lockpicks. A twinge of terror tore through Robert as he, Silver and Dimitri stepped through the flat into the backstage area of the big top. Beneath the pile of freshly washed things they were bringing to hang up on the costume rail for the performers, Robert was smuggling in his own bag of clothes. His plan was to hide them among the outfits, where they might not be noticed. Then he would collect them later, during their escape attempt. The makeup tables, costume rail and a rack of props were set up in the centre of the tent. While Dimitri and Silver hung up the clean washing, Robert pulled his clothes from the bag, found a free hanger and hung them on it. He placed his Dar's coat over the suit and was just stuffing his cap into its pocket so that everything was in place to collect later during their escape when he heard a noise coming from the arena. Robert stuffed the laundry bag into a large polka dot clown suit and sneaked over to peer through the velvet curtains. In the ring, the hybrids were rehearsing. Slimwood was sitting in the front row of seats, barking orders. Look at that one, Dimitri said. They have it so bad, worse than us. I know I'm not supposed to, but I do feel sorry for them. Robert was relieved to hear it. Surely, he thought, if Dimitri and the others did have empathy for the plight of the hybrids, then there was some chance, however slim, that he could persuade them to work together and help each other get out. His heart leaped to his throat as he caught sight of Lily. She was with Madame, and they were walking from the edge of the ring to its centre. Robert couldn't help but think of that cold winter's day when they first met. Lily had been trapped by Madame back then too, in Brackenbridge Manor, and she had climbed out of her window to come and speak with him. He'd missed her so much in the day they'd been apart. And now the anxiety that had scrunched up inside him in a tight ball since they parted began to loosen ever so slightly. Because here she was, bright as rain, and looking much the same as she always did. And while he was in his thread in the new threadbare uniform, with mud around the edges, she was still wearing her bright birthday dress. Madame seemed to be explaining how to bow and curtsy to the crowds. Robert wondered again what the woman had planned for Lily and what she'd done with Malcolm, for he was nowhere to be seen. He felt for the wallet of lockpicks in his pocket. I wanted to get them to Lily if Madame was training her one-on-one -on -one like this. Robert was deciding whether to try and sneak a little closer to hear what Madame was saying, when Silver put her hand out to signal she could keep that he should keep still. Across the ring, Luca had fallen to the floor. Slimwood strode over to him. Get up, he shouted, hitting Luca around the hips with his whip. Luca shook his head and clapped his claws. Then with a clenched jaw, he rose and continued with his rehearsal. See? Silver sucked her teeth. They'll beat you, but not on the arms or legs. They take care to do it, where it won't be seen in the show. It seemed that the hybrid rehearsal time was over. Strange, because Lily hadn't actually rehearsed her act, and the machine the clowns had mentioned last night was nowhere to be seen. But before he could think more about this, the rest of the circus families began arriving in the big top, escorted in by the roustabouts. As Robert watched each performer find a free space in the arena and begin warming up, Madame and Lily left the ring. We have to join everyone else for rehearsal, Silver whispered. If we're missing, there'll be trouble. But if you want to talk to Lily, you should hide in here and give her the lockpicks as she goes out or goes past. Robert nodded. As Silver and Dimitri disappeared off into the arena, he concealed himself behind a costume rail and ducked down, crouching against the floor. His pulse echoed in his ears and he wrapped his arms around his knees to stop his hands from shaking. This might be his one chance to get the pits to Lily. Madame brought Lily backstage through the velvet curtains. Lily looked tense, her fists clenched at her sides and her shoulders stiff. 
Her face was pale, her eyes red and tired as if she'd been crying. Madame took her over to the rack of costumes and began searching through them. Robert balled himself up tighter beneath the rail as she flipped through the clothes above him. Her black lace boots paced to and fro. Lily, still clad in her party shoes, stood stock still. Bien, we shall find something to fit you, Madame was saying as she per uh, perused the rail of spangly outfits. She pulled out a green dress and held it up. Not too big. A frilly blue tutu, too small. A black sequin leotard, too spangly. Madame swished through costumes on the rail, getting closer to him. Robert's pulse was so loud in his ears, he was surprised she couldn't hear it. Her perfume was making the back of his throat itch, and he sensed a sneeze coming. He pursed his lips together, trying to stifle it. Madame was only a few, uh, a few feet from him now. Lily trailed behind. This might be his only chance. He was determined to get the pics to her. He pulled the pouch from his pocket and then thought for a moment before taking out his pencil stub and a chocolate wrapper, which he wrote on. Meet me at midnight. I'm with the buttons in room. He turned the wrapper over and scrawled on the other side. Six. He folded the message and stuffed it behind a lockpick. Then he closed the wallet and threw it gently across the floor so it landed at Lily's feet. Lily saw the wallet and was about to bend down and pick it up when Madame pulled something off the rail. How about this? Madame said. She had chosen a sparkly white dress. We will sew a heart on the front. She held it up against Lily. Yes, perfect. You must try it on. Now. Lily kicked the wallet behind her back foot. We oui, Matnon. Don't talk back. Go behind the screen over there. She held out the dress. Lily went to take it, but dropped it. Oops, butterfingers. You really are the most clumsy Jean Fille. Sorry, I'll get it. Robert gulped. Surely Madame would see the wallet when Lily picked up the dress. Lily crouched down and gave him the briefest of smiles through the rack of clothes. A grin like a warm ray of sunshine. Robert grinned back, relieved that she'd seen him. When she stood back up clasping the dress, the wallet was gone. She had it and would get his message. All he needed to do now was to wait for them to leave and then sneak out front, like he'd been with the others all along. Lily stepped between him and Madame, holding the dress up so he wouldn't be spotted. He shuffled further behind the hanging rows of clothes in his hiding place to make sure he was out of view. But as he did so, the itch in his nose grew and the sneeze he'd been stifling came suddenly rushing out. Madame gave a blood-curdling scream, which was joined by the piercing blast of a whistle from the ring, and before Roberts even knew or had time to take a breath, the lump had burst through the backstage curtains and collared him from behind the rail pole. The lump dragged Robert to the centre of the ring and threw him down in the dust. Slimwood gave Robert's legs a swipe with his whip that smarted sharp as a stinging nettle. What have you done, boy? He prowled round Robert, crouched on the floor. There was a laugh as Madame entered the arena, clasping Lily, who had now changed into the spangly costume. costume. He was hiding in the dressing room. I'm sure he's been stealing, the ringmistress snapped. Empty your pockets, Stunwood shouted. Robert tried to turn away, but Stunwood yanked him to his feet and rifled through his pockets. The pen knife, the pencil stub tumbled out into his palms. Contraband, Stunwood shouted. It's your third black mark, boy. Now you will be punished. Madame smirked at Lily, still holding her arm in a vice-like grip. I'm afraid your, I'm afraid your friend couldn't obey the rules, and we need to make it absolutely clear what happens to per perturb perturbators. There we go, perturbators and troublemakers who don't toe the line. She nodded to Slimwood, who shouted loudly, "Bring out the beast wagon!" A shiver rippled through the crowd of circus folk, and they whispered to one another. They knew exactly what that meant. Lily glanced queasily at Robert. The colour had drained from his face. In a bevy of loud screeches and growls, the lump wheeled the animal cages into the centre of the ring. The big cats and the bear inside were growing crazy, throwing themselves against the bars as he brought it to a stop beneath the high wire. Slowly he turned, a ratchet on the side to open at the top of the cage. Now for the punishment, someone in turn. Robert heard a hiss from his left and turned to see that Silver had sidled close to him. If they put you in with the animals, she whispered. Throw your arms up in the air and blow raspberries at them as loud as you can. The only thing that scares them. 
Robert nodded in a horrified daze. You will walk the wire, Madame smiled, over the cage, and if you make it to the other side, then you, then you will have learned your lesson. But I can't. Robert glanced at the wire. It cut through the dark heights of the big top, as sharp and taut as the fear inside him. I'm afraid of heights. What if I fall? The beast, the wild beast paced about beneath it. I'll end up in there. How sad. But then you will no longer be our problem. I hear the lions have been quite ravenous of late. Please, Lily cried, don't, don't make him go up there alone. But Madame ignored her plea. Lily pulled away from her and rushed through the crowd to Angelique. You mustn't let him fall, she whispered tearfully to the wind girl. I beg you. I'm sorry I didn't tell you the truth about my mamma and draws, but Robert has nothing to do with any of that. He's good and kind, and I know you are too. Don't let them harm him, please. Angelique's eyes flickered with fright and indecision. She didn't know what to do. There was a screeching and a crunching sound from inside the cage. Robert quaked in his boots. He tried to remember Dar's advice. What he'd said every time Robert had been afraid. No one conquers fear easily. It takes practice to reach true heights. A brave heart to win great battles. He repeated those words carefully to himself as he climbed higher and higher into the roof of the tent, where a hanging platform led out onto the high wire, strung out over the baying animals below. Dee Dee was already on the platform, having just finished from rehearsing her act. Robert glanced dizzily down at the ground. Far below the circus folk had gathered in bunches at the edges of the rink, watching in shock and horror. Robert shuffled towards the edge of the platform and stared out along the wire, then down into the open cage of animals. If he fell, he'd land in there with them. He clutched at his chest for the monk moon locket, hoping it would bring him luck, but of course it wasn't there. I can't do this, he whispered to Dee Dee, who was standing beside him. It's all right. Dee Dee handed him the balance bar. I'll help you. Take off your boots so you can feel the wire beneath you. Robert did as he was told, pulling off his boots and his socks. Somehow the cold of the metal platform under his feet and Dee Dee's soft and soothing voice helped to calm him. Keep your head up and your gaze steady, Dee Dee said. When you take your foot, your back foot off the wire, swing it out and lean a little in the opposite direction. That way you'll keep your balance and no matter what, always move forward, never back. But how do I know where to place my feet if I can't see them? Robert asked. Put the heel of your front foot against the toes of your back, Dee Dee explained. Horribly. You can't go wrong that way. She balled a fist and placed it over his belly, then his heart. Find your courage here and here. It's the only way you're going to make it. Robert placed one foot on the wire. Don't think, Dee Dee whispered. Thoughts are bad. Feel your way. Sense the wire beneath your feet. Put one foot in front of the other and walk the line step by step. Robert's mind whirred. But he did as he was told, moving forward, feeling the open space of the ring yawning beneath him. And don't look down. Dee Dee called to him. But as soon as she said that, it was as if his eyes couldn't resist. It was like when someone tells you not to think of pink elephants and then that's all you can think of. Unable to stop himself, he glanced at the ground far below and realised he was walking above the open top of the cage. Then Robert lost his grip on the balance bar and it bounced off the wire and toppled sideways into the cage. He reached for it desperately as it fell, lost his footing, tipped to the side and tumbled. Grasping at the wire, snatching at it with his fingers, and miraculously, he managed to get a grip. Which is how Robert found himself swinging back and forth, gazing between his dangling feet. Sweat slipped his palms. Hair stood up on his back, and his arms stretched out in a sharp knife of pain. Trying to wrench themselves from their sockets. Below him in the cage, the lions and tigers leaped onto their boxes, huffing and roaring excitedly while the bear scuffed at sawdust with his claws and snarled, rearing up on his hind legs. Beyond the animals, Robert glimpsed dots of faces and splodges of colour, colourful costumes. Lily in her sparkling outfit stood out amongst everyone else in their rehearsal clothes, entreating the circus players who were running about looking for something to catch him with. Madame and Slimwood looked on with detached amusement at the chaos their actions had caused. Hold on, Dee Dee screamed. Leave him be, Madame shouted at her, or else. There'll be a second strike on your record, some would warn Dee Dee with a sneer. Dee Dee ignored their commands and ran towards Robert, her metal feet clasping the bouncing wire with their whirring toes to stop, uh, sorry, each step. 
When she got close to him, she tried to sit down on the rope and haul him back up onto it. Give me your hand, she said. Robert shook his head. He didn't want to let go. The fingers on both his hands were loosening, about to slip. Each arm felt weary and weak. He didn't know which to let go of with first. He took his left hand off the rope and reached out to her. It was the wrong choice. The other wasn't strong enough alone to hold him. The dead weight of his body pulled him down, and he fell. Thank you for joining me for chapter 17. I'll have to see what happens in chapter 18.